Hello, everybody. Um, we're just going to wait to see how many people can file in before we get started, but we're happy to see that, oh, already have a lot of people showing up. So I'm going to give it about a minute before we get everything going. Okay, I'm gonna say we have a quorum now, so we will get started. Um, thank you everybody for attending. Uh, before we get into kind of what this presentation is about and everything, um, I'm Chris Lutz and I'm speaking with an attorney that I work with all the time, Sam Breslow. Um, we've probably been working in the digital goods and services space together for six, seven years now, I wanna say. Um, and it's just an area that's constantly evolving. So. Uh, before we get into that, I just want to thank everybody who's attended previous presentations and for attending today. Honestly, I've been blown away by the turnout, the feedback, just how good of experience this whole thing has been. Um, please keep the feedback coming. Um, we are definitely trying to tailor future presentations to the, the desires of people who attend these things. So um, I know Jordan and I are giving a presentation in a few weeks that will um, that responds to something that we got before. And I think Dave Hughes, Sam and Fred Marcus are going to be doing the same a little bit later. Um, this is my second presentation in two weeks. So I think next week or is it the week after um, you'll be getting Marilyn and Breen. So you won't be having to hear from me for a, a little while. Um, but yeah, no, it's just been an awesome experience. So please keep them coming. Um, a few housekeeping notes. We, um, we will have poll questions for people who want CPE. We're going to ask one kind of earlier and one sort of later in the presentation. We always have issues with some people who are viewing this in their browser don't see the poll questions. Don't worry about that. If you don't see the poll questions when I bring them up after the presentation, um, just reach out to Hillary, who will be sending out a follow up email and let her know you weren't able to see it. We haven't had any issues with resolving that. So um, no need to fret if, if those poll questions don't come up. Um, but other than that, I think just be sure to respond to the survey at the end of the presentation, because like I said, that's incredibly helpful. Um, and we're, you know, we just really appreciate all the feedback. This presentation, we, we are not registered for CLE. I don't believe we'll confirm afterward, but this is, uh, we have, we have CPE and not CLE for this. So, um, with that, I kind of want to just sort of introduce what we are presenting on today and what we're not presenting on today. Um, to get a sense of how everybody feels, if people are comfortable with the software or not, let's just do our first poll question. Ah, that was the wrong poll question. Oh no. I was so proud of myself of doing this correctly last time. Launch polling. Have you attended any prior h &B webinars? This is great. We're getting a lot of nope. This is my firsts. Interesting. Yeah. So I'll give it a few seconds. Um, got about 87% of the votes are in. Okay. So we've got a, new, um, a pretty easy split. We've got 15% of attended everything. 45% this is our first, 38% um, won previously. And somebody's asking, wait, is this a webinar? Two people are. Well, fortunately for you, this presentation is really gonna get into the characterization of digital goods and services. So we will talk about what a webinar is and maybe in Wisconsin, whether it's taxable. Um, so yeah, I think in our little blurb that we sent out, um, the, there have been a lot of cases recently about the taxation of software. You know, whether it's the Russell Community Hospital case, the Citrix case, um, we're not really going to get into that. We're not going to get into really pre-written versus custom software. Um, we're not going to talk explicitly about SaaS or cloud computing, you know, because generally in our experience, you know, whether a state taxes those types of items is often just a very clear yes or no question that can easily be confirmed by research, unless, of course, you're Alabama, which came up with a very convoluted way to characterize something that's taxable. Um, what we're going to do is sort of go a tier deeper than that, maybe multiple tiers deeper. 
and talk about sort of when you actually have digital goods and products. And, you know, often when we're talking about those, we're talking about things like audiovisual works, books, things like that. Um, but we can dig deeper into other types of nuanced, sophisticated digital goods. And then, of course, services. Um, a common theme throughout this presentation is going to be, you know, are you really, are you providing service? Or are you providing software? Or are you providing a service using the software or the internet as an infrastructure to provide what's otherwise a service that maybe somebody could have provided 50 years ago in manual form? Um, so that's going to be the purpose of this presentation, to really dig into what type, what type of thing you're actually selling and then how a state will treat that. Because, and I, I think there are probably many people attending this webinar who I've, I've made this joke um, with before, but, you know, often when we deal with the marketing people, the business side of a lot of our clients, they all want to be software providers. We sell software. We are a sophisticated software company. Um, you don't always want to be a software company, right? And, and I think when we dig deeper, a lot of the time what we, what we find is you're a service provider who uses software. So that's, that's really what we're going to get into. Um, and in order to sort of facilitate that discussion, um, we're, we're just going to sort of use three high level ways of discussing it. First is, what are you? How do you characterize what your goods and what your services are? Um, second is, okay, once we've determined the nature of that service, um, where is it apportioned? How do you source it? What if your um, subscriber or customer has multiple place, points of use? Um, what are the constitutional constraints on the state's ability to tax all or a portion of that sale? And then finally, once you've concluded that, all right, this thing is taxable, or maybe it's not, but we're subject to income tax because of the sales we're making to a state. What do I do? I'm filing in one state now, but post Wayfair, I've, I've got Nexus in 25 states. How do I wrap my head, hands around that? What does the triage process look like? Um, and then finally, what this presentation really isn't, but there's always a Nexus between the two, is um, we're not going to do a deep dive into the income tax side of things today. This is much more focused on the indirect transaction tax, but I will highlight just sort of briefly right now, um, if we have time to, we have a last slide on it. We're happy to answer any questions on income tax. Um, a lot of the characterization discussions we're having for sales and use tax will blend into um, the income tax realm. But, but often, you know, income tax might just have a catch-all for intangibles, whereas in the sales and use tax context, um, characterizations dive much deeper. So that's what we're going to try, try to sort of do on the indirect side. And, you know, we might mention income here and there, but it's not going to be a deep dive in, into income. Um, so with that, yeah. I will hand this over to Sam. That was a great setup. Thanks, Chris. Uh, I, don't, I don't think Chris mentioned this, but we did get some feedback in some prior presentations that they could only see one of the speakers. So just as an FYI, you can change your speaker view at the top to either see both of us together or just whoever's speaking. Um, but we, we don't control that for you. Um, but yeah, so, so thanks for that setup, Chris. I think before we can really understand uh, the apportionment concept, or um, sourcing, we have to start with taxability and what is a digital good. And you can see we've set this out in the context of the Streamline Sales and Use Tax Agreement. And why is Streamline our starting point for this presentation? Well, because it's also the starting point for the 23 states that are full members of the Streamline Sales and Use Tax Agreement. So as a little bit of background on Streamline, for some of you that may or maybe not as familiar, um, it was initiation, initiated back in 2000 to develop a kind of a streamlined sales and use tax system that would ease tax compliance. Um, the idea behind it is you have different levels of membership. You have full members, um, which are the, the 23 or 24 states that currently are. You have one associate member state, Tennessee, and then some states just don't adopt it at all. But what does Streamline require? Well, if you are a Streamline full member, um, you can't tax digital products by including them within the definition of tangible personal property or telecommunication services. The idea is you have to specifically carve it out and, and define it using the definitions that they set forth. But those definitions are really a starting point. You can expound upon them. You can give more guidance. So as an example, Wisconsin, 
they use the definition of a digital audio visual work that's defined within Streamline, which is a series of related images, which when shown in succession impart an impression of motion together with accompanying sounds, if any, they use that definition, but then they add additional clarification. So within that, they also clarify that entertainment programs, live events um, may also fit within that category, um, but not uh, video greeting cards or electronic games. So the idea is a streamline is the starting point for those definitions, but they can add additional clarification. Um, you know, Chris and I were talking about the fact that when you see some of these terms, you might think that this is, you know, this doesn't really uh, capture my business or this doesn't really capture the type of taxpayers that I work with. Um, you see something like a digital audio visual work and your first instinct is streaming television, right? Something like a, a Netflix. But something that might also fit within that category could be something like a webinar, like we're doing here, which we'll touch upon later on. Digital audio works. So the classic example of that would be a downloaded song. But what about something more nuanced, like a podcast? Um, a digital book. So a classic example of that would be an ebook. But what about a newsletter or a blog that you charge for? Uh, Wisconsin um, has these same three categories uh, under a specified digital product. They also have an additional digital good category, which I think is a little bit interesting in the state of Wisconsin. And then what they say is that uh, a webinar or a blog or a newsletter could fit within that other category. So the idea is that this is our starting point. Um, there are a couple states that recently adopted a definition of digital goods within uh, their statute, those being Connecticut and Rhode Island. I think Connecticut's interesting because prior to October of 2019, which is when they uh, added the definition of um, digital goods to TPP so that Connecticut's not a streamlined state, so they can do that. They can just add digital goods to the definition of tangible personal property. Before that, they taxed digital goods as computer or data processing services at a lower rate, which is a good example of how states um, that didn't previously specifically define a digital product might sort of shoehorn it under uh, a service that's already characterized within their statute. But so what, so what are some different ways uh, that, or what are some different characterizations that might impact the taxability of a digital product? Um, Rights of use and continued payment are a couple things that might change the character or the characterization of taxability. So in most states to be taxable, a digital good has to be a transfer to an end user. Um, there's a, recently a, an interesting Arkansas decision about the fact that whether a library is really an end user so a library that uh, provides versions of newspapers, ebooks, digital video to customers, whether they in fact are um, the end user when they're really just kind of providing it for their own use. And uh, the state says they are because ultimately um, it's being distributed to patrons, um, but they are using it for their own use in this context. So an interesting example of how uh, an end user might be a little bit nuanced. Yeah, and to, to add to that, um, that's something Sam and I have been seeing creep, crop up a little bit more recently. You know, you've got somebody who doesn't sell any digital goods, right? And in the library, and since it's complicated because they're then loaning it out to third parties, mm -hmm. but a lot of people just use the software for their own purposes. The seller's not collecting tax, but they might get audited themselves from a use tax perspective. And that can really be an unwieldy process because you're not necessarily as familiar with the item that's being sold, right? You're the one who's purchasing it. You don't know all the back end stuff, the taxability characterizations. Um, and you might have dozens, if not more, subscriptions that have to be scrutinized. Yeah, no, that's a great, that's a great point, Chris. Uh, we've seen it in the context of the Chicago lease transaction tax, which is a, a SAS tax, which is a little bit outside the scope of what we're talking about here. But it certainly puts a, a strange burden on um, a, a customer who's an end user to be able to know really the details about what, you know, how that software was created or how it's used. Um, so a, a couple other ways that might change the characterization, uh, whether the digital good is sold with rights of use less than permanent, uh, meaning um, if you're just providing a temporary use, so like a customer that rents a movie on Amazon Prime, 
you're only renting that movie. You don't have a permanent use to view it. Uh, does that less than permanent use change the characterization as taxable or not? In a state like uh, Indiana or Idaho, yes, it has to be permanent for it to be taxable. Um, and then uh, another way could be conditioned or continued payments. So let's say that you subscribe to a streaming service and you pay a monthly subscription. Does that affect taxability? In Idaho, they say that digital subscriptions are not taxable, so uh, it might. But then there are states like South Dakota, which pretty much tax everything under the sun. So I think South Dakota's statute is an interesting one. It's really encompassing. So they say that a sale of digital goods um, taxes imposed if the sales to an end user or someone that's not an end user, uh, if it has a right of permanent use or a right to less than permanent use, if it's conditioned upon payment or if it's not conditioned upon payment. It's sort of an interesting catch-all statute that uh, they're, they're really gonna get everything um, in the, the taxable category. So that's sort of a, the framework for the definitions of digital goods set forth by Streamline. And as, we, as I mentioned, uh, states can uh, expand upon that. But, but what about the, those states that aren't full members of uh, Streamline? Let's, let's move on to the next slide, Chris, with the characterization of the sales. Unless, unless you wanted to, did you want to mention blockchain before we move well, on? I just, I, yeah, I just wanted to, and you, you hit on this before, so we don't need to linger on it. But, yeah. you know, I do think that there's often the tendency for, for a lot of people to say, you know, we're not, we're not Netflix. We're not purveyors of digital goods, of audiobooks, of, of audio. It, it really doesn't, um, not, none of this is really relevant to us. And I think that now what we're seeing is kind of this expansion of the universe of the types of digital goods and services that we're talking about. Um, and so in the context of virtual currency and blockchain, just keep in mind that, you know, the feds identify virtual currency as property, not as, as currency. And you get into a lot of sales and use tax issues where if I'm purchasing something with virtual currency in a state, is it characterized as a normal retail sale or in some states as a barter transaction? And if it's a barter transaction, both parties have a corresponding use tax obligation. But what if the state doesn't tax intangibles or if it doesn't have guidance as to what virtual currency is. Um, so just to keep in mind that there's a lot of other stuff moving around. And I know there are a lot of um, sellers who do accept virtual currency. And so it's important to keep in mind that in some states, you're not engaging in a normal retail sale, but it might be characterized in a different way that creates different types of tax obligations. Yeah, it can certainly affect the taxable base as to how much is, is subject to sales tax. Um, but in the context of characterizing sales, so again, what about those states that are not full members of Streamline um, and don't specifically enumerate digital products as taxable, or they just conclude that it's not a digital good, it's something else, it's a service. So we've, we've isolated a few examples of uh, digital or, or taxable services that could include digital services. Um, you know, many of these statutes are very old. Uh, for example, I know Texas was adopted back in, in uh, 1987, their data processing services statute, but yet they're still trying to um, tax some modern digital goods and services under that statute. So let's, let's walk through a few of these and I'll provide some examples so you have a better understanding of what could fall within these. So the first being digital automated services out of Washington. Uh, sorry, yeah, still in the sky. Uh, it's a service that uses one or more software applications that's transferred electronically. What does that mean? Well, a, a car history report service, like a Carfax, that could uh, qualify as a digital automated service. They, um, the state of Washington's clarified that on their, their own website. A photo sharing service, that could fall within it, but not a payment processing service or um, a data processing service. So that, that's sort of interesting that uh, it doesn't fall within it within the state of Washington. Um, there was recently a decision out of Washington about an online inventory management service that allowed customers to sort of track their purchases and sales. And Washington got into analysis as to whether that was a data processing service or whether that was a digital automated service. And uh, ultimately they concluded it was a digital automated service because what the customer was paying for was the extensive business solution, not the extraction of info. But uh, it's, it's just a good example of really trying to define taxability, even just within the context of comparing different types of services. 
Um, an information service out of New York uh, is furnishing information. Um, it could be uh, analyzing, compiling information. But the important thing to remember with information services, it's, it can't be something that's information that's personal or individual in nature. Um, I, I, I want to quickly touch upon a, a New York decision out of the New York Court of Appeals back in June of 19. It's called Wegmans Foods. I think it's kind of an interesting decision. So uh, in that case, the taxpayer went to grocery stores and they looked on the shelves, they aggravated, they aggregated the sales prices of the different products. And then they went back and uh, created reports that they sold to customers. So an issue was whether that was a taxable information service in the state of New York. And they concluded, which is really consistent with the line of case law um, related to information services, that it, it was taxable. It didn't fall within that exemption for personal or individual information because anybody can go into a grocery store. Anyone can go take that information and compile it or analyze it. Um, I, I think I'm going to hold on a discussion of Texas. Uh, and there's a, a recent controller decision that we're going to get into on the next slide. But those are some, you know, some good examples of services that might be taxable in the state. I, I, think, uh, I think what people often struggle with is the difference between a data processing service and an information service. <laughs> So States I, I do too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Um, and I think that's why this Texas decision that uh, Chris is going to talk about um, on the next slide is so important because they just sort of to put them together and don't really differentiate between, between the two. But uh, the idea at a high level is that an information service is supposed to be handling data that's more general in nature. Again, we just talked about the carve out for personal or in individual information versus data processing is supposed to be more customer specific or proprietary information. And another important service to throw on here that we didn't put is telecommunication service, yeah. right? We see that a lot. Yeah, and I'm, I'm holding on Connecticut as well because Connecticut recently did define uh, digital goods within their statute. So um, that might or may not be less relevant now. Uh, so moving on to uh, some specific cases that deal with the characterization of sales as either a service or a digital good, SaaS, it could be something else. Um, the first one we're going to talk about is Wisconsin, uh, the State Bar of Wisconsin versus Department of Revenue uh, from September of last year. So Wisconsin uh, was analyzing whether the CLE courses um, that the Wisconsin Bar provided whether they are a taxable digital audiovisual work um, or whether they are a tax exempt educational service. It's, it, I mean, we're gonna discuss this case later on in the context of bundled services, but it's really an interesting case as far as their conclusion because what they ultimately decide is that the true object here of the sale is something more than just the, uh, the images that are transferred, the succession of images transferred, that it's the educational service that people are really buying, which I'm, I'm not really sure if I agree with that decision because what they're saying here is that it's not just the succession of images that people are buying, they're buying this CLE credit, but isn't everything more than just a succession of images? Isn't any sort of live streaming program more than that? I'm not really sure if that makes sense. Um, I mean, I do well, think that we know nobody is watching this presentation just for CPE, right? <laughs> Fair enough. Maybe you just proved Wisconsin's point. But uh, yeah, that's, that's a really interesting one. Um, and it sort of sets the framework for taxing live educational or business seminars. Um, Chris touched on this a, a little bit earlier, but uh, a few states have recently put out guidance on this. So uh, Wisconsin has said that a live educational or business seminar by a webcast is not subject to tax as a digital good. Iowa has put out guidance and theirs more falls into the, uh, the issue of the level of participation. So the, the concept being if a live presentation isn't taxable, well then the webinar is only taxable if it's different. So if you go to a live presentation and you can ask questions, but in the webinar version, you can't ask questions, well, then the webinar version is going to be taxable. And I think probably what they're trying to get at there is a distinction for purposes of the Internet Tax Freedom Act, which I, I don't want to get into here because uh, Dave Hughes and I previously did an hour long presentation, a webinar that you can go listen to. 
But I think that's probably what they were trying to achieve. Um, but yeah, the, those are some good examples of states trying to highlight. I think that's something that's going to be even more relevant now as we all work from home and do more of um, kind of a work from home seminar or presentation where you are charging, which we're not here. This is free. <laughs> uh, Chris, do you want to touch on J2 Cloud? Yeah, I mean, this case has it all, <laughs> you know, we have characterization of a sophisticated type of electronic service. We have how, how should it be sourced? Um, we have ITFA claims as well. Um, and then to boot, the taxpayer was penalized for taking what seemed like a pretty reasonable position. So um, I got to tip my hat to, you know, the people who litigated this case. They, they did a thorough job. They had expert testimony. What we really had was, um, and I'm sure a lot of people on this call have a similar service provider, where if somebody faxes, uh, sends a fax to, one, to my fax number, it gets converted to an email with a PDF. Um, and this service provider um, provided a number of formats that you could receive, a, receive that fax, but most people opted for a PDF. And, and so what would happen is a person would send a fax out, it would be directed to these servers, um, the taxpayer had switches that would basically take that fax, it would turn it on into numerous servers that would manipulate that data and send it out as an email to whatever email the, um, the customer identified. Now, um, they had the option to use an email that was provided by this service provider or to use their own email. Um, most people would use their own email, most people would use, use a PDF. So in Massachusetts, telecommunication services are taxable. And the question was whether this company that converts faxes into emails, whether they fell within the, the category of being a taxable telecom service provider. And the taxpayer referred to themselves as a document management service, but in previous 10Ks and other things like that, they'd identified themselves as a faxing service, the world's most sophisticated electronic faxing service. And so the court, well, it's the appellate tax board, looks into the state's definition of what telecommunication services are and ultimately concluded that that fairly broad definition in incorporated what this company was doing, notwithstanding the fact that what they really were doing was taking, it was, it was more like a data processing service or communication facilitation service. It doesn't fall squarely within telecom. Um, they weren't using their own wires, really. If that, if that distinction makes sense. Um, and there were numerous elements, going back to Sam's point about bundled transactions, there were numerous elements, different types of services that this taxpayer provided that allowed people to, you know, edit, manipulate, create preferences with how they received the PDFs that were inc included in one bundled transaction. Well, because there was no differentiation of those services from a cost perspective, the entire thing was treated as one bundled telecom taxable transaction. The taxpayer then takes the position, well, and this goes into our sourcing conversation, but I'll raise it now because it's really, you know, useful in this context. But we don't know where they're receiving our emails. How could we possibly source this as a telecommunication service to Massachusetts? And Massachusetts says, that's all well and good. You're right. It's not defined. It, we can't really determine that. So we're just going to use the Massachusetts population percentage compared to the U.S. and have that be the apportionment methodology. Um, it, so, I mean, really, it was an aggressive interpretation of the services telecom and then an aggressive means of apportioning those services to the state. Um, but it gets into a, you know, do a deep dive on what your services are and be honest with yourself. Um, the fact that they impose penalties on this, I'm not sure how the taxpayer ever could have proactively come up with a WADA with the Massachusetts apportionment, you know, Massachusetts versus everywhere kind of approach, you know, sort of on its original returns. But um, that's ultimately what um, the appellate tax board required. Um, the Texas Comptroller decision is, is what Sam alluded to earlier, which has to do with the distinction between information services and data processing services. So what we had was a service provider who in Texas um, had a minor presence, but you know, something we're going to stipulate for all of these conversations is that in a post Wayfair world, you probably have nexus with everybody. Um, you know, if you're of a, of a certain size, um, so putting aside the nexus concerns in that case, what you had was 
this company would provide analytics to the restaurant industry. So they, and they would do so in two ways. One is they would say, give us your information, turnover of hourly employees, costs, cash, all this sort of stuff. And we'll take it, we'll manipulate it, we'll put it into a report that contextualizes your business with respect to your industry nationally, regionally, size, you know, all these, you know, whether you're a chain, whether you are a um, takeout, you know, all these different things, we can manipulate all of that. So on audit, the department determined that this was a taxable information service. Now, why does the distinction between information service and data processing service matter? And how does it come into play in this case? Well, for both information and uh, data processing services, uh, they're they only tax 80% of the base. So if it's a hundred dollar sale, only $80 of that will be subject to tax. For information services though, if you're using proprietary information, that proprietary information is not subject to tax. For data processing services, it is. So a lot of the argument here was, well, wait a second, we're going in, we're dealing with these restaurants, we're looking at their specific numbers and we're manipulating it for them and providing them that information in the context of this national uh, database that we ourselves have collected and maintained. That's all proprietary, shouldn't be taxable. And, and the comptroller really said, we're gonna sidestep that. We think what you're doing is providing both an information service and a data processing service. So we, you know, if we're weak on one side, we get you on the other. It's all gonna be taxable at 80% of the base, um, which, I was sort of brainstorming for a while. How do I then ever have a proprietary information service that's not taxable? And I think there are still ways, but this ruling I think really narrows the universe of that proprietary information. Um, and I think, so I, I think yeah. part, part of the way the court made that distinction, Chris, because I think that's a really interesting point is the fact that the customers didn't have an enforceable property right to the information. Maybe it's, it's a level of control that the customers have could control. It's true. And, and that, that was certainly raised the idea that, well, once the customers had these reports, they were sort of free to do whatever they wanted with them. Right. Yeah. That still doesn't yeah. totally convince me. Um, and I, I see that. I, I, I'm sorry. I didn't mention it. Uh, J2 cloud was Massachusetts. Yep. Yeah. Um, Massachusetts, the Pella tax board. Yeah. So um, I don't know. Did you have anything else to add Sam? No, I, I think yeah, you nailed that. Um. Cool. So, okay. Um, and, you know, if, if we're being honest, we could have sat on characterization of services for this entire presentation. So um, in order to keep things moving, uh, we'll get into sourcing, but rest assured, there is no shortage of cases and rulings out there right now that really dig deep into the characterization of a service. Yeah, no, um, that's a good point. I mean, we sort of highlighted some of the ones that we think are more interesting or more relevant or had uh, holdings that were distinguishable, but yeah, we have, we have a, a list of cases that we thought about discussing as well. So um, there are some really good resources out there if you'd like to talk more about some recent cases. Yeah, um, and, and, and I'll add, most of the cases and rulings out there are about the characterization of the service, not about, okay, we all stipulate this thing is taxable, where does it get sourced? But, but I do think sourcing is a very important part of this equation. So, so what does Streamline do? Um, I'm often loath to read what's on the slide. <laughs> you know, I want to talk about this contextually and everything, but we really just kind of have to go through it. What does section 310 of, the stre of Streamline say? So first, if the good is received at the business location of the seller, it's that location. I can't imagine many circumstances where a digital good or service is received at the business location of the seller, right? So if that's not the case- You go, you go and pick up a, a CD with the software on it or something? Yeah. It's, well, it, would, it, it would have to be like a, a load and leave situation at the business seller's location. It just seems like an unlikely answer in digital goods and services context. Um, if the product's not received there, then it's location where receipt, receipt by the purchaser occurs. Um, and that would be whatever in information that the customer gets. And, and it's important to note that receipt in this context um, means where the customer takes first possession or makes first use. Um, and we'll get into in a minute, well, what happens if it's split up between multiple locations or, 
or something along those lines. Um, so if neither of these first two are met, then what we do is we look at the location indicated by the address of the purchaser available from the seller's business records. So if you have an ongoing relationship, um, you know, this is kind of what we do, right? When we bring in a client, we do an intake form, please give us your information, et cetera. And we, we would then have that be the location to which um, the transaction should be sourced. Um, and if none of those apply, then we look at the location indicated um, at the consummation of sale. So I make a purchase and I have a zip code associated with my credit card or something like that. That becomes um, the location. And then we've got this more hazy category, which I'm not sure how often this will apply, but if none of those other applies, I kind of take, and Sam, you're more of an expert on this than I, it kind of becomes an origination test at this point. Um, the address from which the digital good delivered was first available for transmission by the seller or from which the service was provided. Now, we're going to get into some rulings that really nuance what it means to provide a service when it's digital. Um, am I providing a service to you all where I am sitting currently or am I providing it where you are, are seeing it? And I think that that distinction um, gets really blurred and you know, it becomes kind of a, a self-serving mechanism for, for states. Um, yeah, it's least quick, before we, we yeah. go on to the sourcing for leases as opposed to a sale, uh, some of you might have been following the Maryland proposed bill that would tax digital goods and products out of that state. It was uh, vetoed by the governor was that last week, um, but it's still up for, uh, it could be passed um, if- There's an override session. Yeah, yeah. Overrides the veto, right? So, but wh wh where I want to touch on it is they pretty much rip off this uh, hierarchy set forth by Streamline, but then they add in a second prong. So instead of moving from business location to the location where the receipt of the purchaser occurs, they insert a primary use location there, which I think is interesting. Um, and I, you know, I'm not sure how that would differentiate in this context. Um, they do sort of define it as the residential street address of the actual end user, end user or if the buyer is not an individual, the buyers uh, were the employees that make use of the digital product in the context of a business occur. But I think that's kind of interesting. Yeah, and, and as we'll talk about um, briefly, that is kind of a modified Mobile Telecommunication Sourcing Act rule, right? It's a federal statute that, that um, dictates how sourcing should occur. It's sort of a, a similar um, premise. Uh, there's a slight nuance when you lease or rent digital goods. Um, I suppose, you know, it doesn't say it there, but license is often the term we used in the intangible digital context. Um, so the first payment that's made is sourced as the retail sale, um, but then the subsequent payments go to whatever address is provided by the customer. And, and it goes back to sort of the point before, I'm not sure how often the, the location of the seller, the business place in the seller is going to be the, uh, the way you apportion the sale. So odds are for a lease or, or rental, you're going to end up having the same method from the first to the second payment. But that's, it makes sense because if you did initiate the lease at the location of a business seller, well, when you leave, we know you're not continuing to use that that digital good in the location of the seller, you're using it where you are. So it makes sense then to sort of default to where your place of business is uh, as provided um, in your records. And, and if, you, if you have a lease or something that is not actual ownership of the digital good, but there's only a single payment, we would use the same um, rules as, as retail sales. Um, the MTSA, so it's federal act, and all but one state, which I believe is Montana, have adopted conforming statutes to the MTSA. Um, the MTSA focuses exclusively on telecommunication services and ultimately says, when there's a telecom service, you source it to the primary place of use. Um, and, and think about it, why would this make sense? I have a cell phone that I travel all around the country with and I use it everywhere. Um, under just the Constitution generally, states could constitutionally say it's minutes on the phone in our state versus minutes on the phone everywhere, and that's how that telecom company has to collect and remit tax from me. 
So they might end up in a given year filing, reporting my, my use in 15 states or something like that. That becomes unwieldy. So instead, what you look to is the primary place of use, which has, has to be two things um, generally. It has to be either the residential or business street address that the customer provides in good faith. But it also has to be within the service provider's um, licensed service area. And that gets kind of um, murky in the context of, of cell phones. I live in Washington, D.C. My number is a 312 number. So it's a Chicago phone number because that's where I lived before I moved to Washington, D.C. I've kept the same provider. The question is, what happens? What if, what if when I moved to D.C., I was outside of that provider's specific service area? Certainly 312 is not a Washington, D.C. number. Um, what are they supposed to do there? And I will, I'll skip ahead because that really um, raises the primary place of use, the Texas policy ruling that, that I've cited here. So um, the taxpayer reached out and they said, hey, Texas, we have people who have left Texas and moved somewhere else. Can we just use our own um, location as a way to source this sale? Because it's difficult to, to follow everybody around. They've, they've still got their Texas numbers. Can we revert to the state? Texas says no. In this case, they basically ignore the fact that it has to be within your, the service provider's licensed area. And they say the MTSA, when written, didn't really anticipate that dynamic of somebody moving out of a jurisdiction into a new one that you might not cover and keep your, their old phone number. But we all know now those first three numbers have very little meaning anymore. You really can't tell where a person is based on those three numbers. And so all they say is you don't need to have it you don't need to be in a licensed area. It still has to be the primary business or residential street address provided by your customer. Um, uh, and then I'll go back up because to the, the Kansas ruling with respect to a uh, video over internet protocol, um, VoIP. <laughs> what, what sorts of things can we use the MTSA to cover that's not just, oh, I'm, I'm your bread and butter telecom provider. You know, we talked about the J2 cloud case before. They said that's a telecom service. How did they apportion it? They apportioned it using just population. Well, I think there's a pretty good argument that if you conform to the MTSA and you're telling me this is a taxable telecommunication service, I'm entitled to use this place of primary use. Now, the problem there was, but you can't tell us what the place of primary use was. Um, in Kansas, we had um, a seller of conferencing and video solutions um, who use audio, the internet, and video bridges to facilitate, you know, video conferencing, kind of what, what we're doing right now. This was provided um, via the cloud. There was no hardwiring here. It was all cloud-based. Um, so I know I said we weren't getting into SaaS, but I guess I kind of lied. Um, and Kansas said, yeah, this is a taxable telecommunication service but you can source to the place of primary use. We don't have to worry about sort of apportioning based on use in Kansas versus use elsewhere. You can use place of primary use. Um, and so, so as we don't get hung up on, on this section for, for much longer, I'll just throw out, there are unique taxes out there that have an interplay with a telecommunication component. Maybe I sell a product that does one thing, but it has a phone number assigned to it for whatever reason, um, you know, some kind of GPS um, solution or something like that. In that case, do I have the argument that the MTSA still governs how I'm supposed to apportion those types of transactions? So we threw a few examples in other services, happy to talk about that um, offline, but just keep in mind, it often can be a, look, we don't know what the answer here is. Can you just give us sort of a, a reasonable methodology for apportionment? Maybe the MTSA can govern. Um, so we're going to pick on Texas a little bit, I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we, in Texas, we had somebody who was providing interactive social gaming experiences for registered users. They give an example of adopting virtual pets I don't know what that means, but I'm just uh, going to roll well, with it. Lucky for you, Chris, I Googled it last night. <laughs> <laughs> Did you? 
There, there are a few, uh, a few online games where you can adopt virtual pets, but yeah, keep going. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think I had a Tamagotchi when I was a kid. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but um, so we have this, we have this reg three point two nine eight that governs where amusements are received, right? In the digital context, that that reg doesn't quite provide the clarity that one would hope. So, in this recent comptroller ruling, what they say is. There, there are really four moving parts here. When, when you go and you buy access to an amusement for state use tax purposes, the transaction is taxable at the location where the person goes physically to the seller and the seller provides them the ticket or what, what have you. For local tax purposes, it's where the actual event occurs. And so if you think about it from a digital standpoint, well, okay, then it would make sense to say it's the seller's place of business when they are selling the amusement. So if I'm sitting in DC and I sell you an amusement that you're going to watch in Texas, my place of business is in DC, but for use tax, for local tax purposes, you, the, the event may be occurring where you're viewing your screen in Texas. The ruling goes on to say, but for electronic gaming, it's consummated, not sure where that word comes from, where it's provided or delivered to the amusement attendee. So we've got seller's place of business, we've got provided, we've got delivered, and then we've got occurred. Um, the ruling ultimately, I think the spirit of the ruling is it discards seller's place of business and it conflates provided, delivered, and occurred to mean where the, cost, where the attendee views the amusement. But I think there are many instances where that answer could be different. And Sam and I kicked this around. I think it's possible you could have a situation where under the reg, it's not subject to state use tax, but the local use tax rule says it's where um, the Texas user occurs. I, I wouldn't recommend that if you're taking a conservative filing position. I don't think I've ever been in a position where we remitted only local tax and not the state tax. Um, it could happen, you know, Colorado, Louisiana, I'm looking at you. Um, but still, it's, it's definitely a, a rare, a rare situation. So um, how do you source amusement services that are digitally provided to Texas? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a good question. And uh, kind of like Chris mentioned earlier, I, I hate to read from the slide, but I think we have to kind of work through how the statute works in Texas. So if a service is used to support a separate identifiable segment of the business, then it's presumed to be used at the location where that part of the business is conducted. And I'm gonna put this into practice in the concept of, uh, of a recent decision out of Texas. But if that part of the business is conducted at locations both within and without the state, the service is not taxable to the extent it's used outside of Texas. So it's sort of allowing you to apportion and not tax the, the percentage of it that's used outside the state. But to the extent the use of the service can't be assigned, cannot be assigned to an, an identifiable segment of the customer's business, then the service is presumed taxable at the customer's principal place of business, uh, that where the place where the trader business is directed or managed. So the whole thing is going to be taxable at that location. So uh, back in October of last year, the comptroller had a decision um, sort of applying this. And the taxpayer argued that only their in-state usage of a data processing service, what the service was, was an online recruitment system that they used. Um, and it's uh, what they argued was our employees are located not just in Texas, but outside of Texas. Uh, our sales figures, our retail locations are throughout the country. And they came up with this sort of magical number. Um, and I'm going to say magical because I think that was really the crux of the issue here. They said that 64% of it occurred outside of Texas. So they wanted to not tax that percentage of it. Uh, they wanted to not pay use tax on that percentage of it that occurred outside the state. But ultimately, the comptroller upheld the assessment because they said there's just, there's just a lack of information here. Um, we agree that you can if you can identify a separate identifiable segment of the business, so in this case, um, maybe if their retail arm were using it in Florida, but their corporate arm were using it in Texas, if you can specifically identify that with your books and records, then sure, we'll give you apportionment here. 
but you can't. All you gave us was a summary percentage in a spreadsheet without any supporting documents. So no, we're not going to allow it. Um, but I, I think this is interesting to keep in mind uh, in Texas that you can sort of limit your use tax exposure by um, using this enforcement provision. And uh, virtual events, um, you know, I think in the context of time here, I'm just going to touch on this really briefly. So it's pretty uh, interesting, though. Yeah, it is. Um, you know, Iowa is sort of a trendsetter here as far as I've seen where um, they recently identified how you would source a virtual event. So uh, the first use of the ticket of admission to a virtual event occurs at the location where the attendee first participates in or accesses the event, if known. If it's unknown, then you go to the normal sourcing rules for TPP. Uh, I just think it's interesting because I haven't seen any other state that has specifically carved out sp um, special sourcing rules for virtual events. And I think we all know that there are going to be more virtual events. So I, I do wonder whether states are going to sort of piggyback off of what uh, Iowa has done here. So Sam, just quickly though, um, yeah. how are those two rules really different, right? Like if it's where the attendee first participates or, participates or accesses versus TPP, which we would generally say is a destination. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, rarely will you not know where your TPP is destined. It seems kind of like it's the same rule, right? Yeah, it could be. And it's similar to what we were talking about with the local sourcing in that Texas decision. Um, it could ultimately be the same. Um, so yeah, multiple points of use. Uh, this is a concept that was uh, identified within the Streamlined Sales and Use Tax Agreement. Um, it provided for an exemption for sellers of digital goods and services used in multiple jurisdictions to a portion and then only remit tax on that portion of the goods or services used in the state. But it was repealed back in 2006. Um, so you may be wondering why we're still talking about it. Well, there are a few states that still have it within their statute. So Massachusetts, Minnesota, Ohio, Washington, even though it was repealed from Streamline, it's still within their state statutes and they still permit the use of MPU certificates. Um, there, there was a recent case out of Massachusetts. So one of the states that still allow uh, multiple points of use. Uh, the Massachusetts Appellate Tax Board, it was a case called Oracle USA versus the Commissioner of Revenue. I don't have the citation on here, but I can provide it if you guys are interested. But I thought it was interesting because in this case, uh, they originally paid tax on the full price of the software and then sought a refund based on the apportioned use outside of the state. And the board allowed the refund because what they said was you were able to work with the seller and arrive at a proper apportionment percentage. So we're going to give it to you. So unlike the comptroller decision I talked about earlier, um, they were able to justify it with their books and records. Um, so sort of an interesting maybe refund opportunity in the, the state of Massachusetts. Yeah, and I'm just going to throw it out there. The very bottom part, what's the problem if the state does not allow? Yeah. It's, it's very possible that a state's rules could be constitutional, you know, it's just billing address or something like that. But to the extent there's ambiguity or a risk of multiple taxation or, you know, um, multiple states taking credit for the sourcing rules, you may constitutionally have an argument that you're entitled to, to a portion based on multiple points of use. With the Chicago transaction tax, before they came out with their affidavit of apportionment and everything like that, we were advising clients that you had a constitutional right to apportion your receipts because they can't just say, oh, we get it whenever it touches our jurisdiction. That would not be internally consistent. Yeah, uh, Chris, I guess for taxpayers that maybe are in a state that doesn't have an MPU provision, would you advise them to take, uh, would you advise them to apportion maybe based on a reasonable method? What are your thoughts? Well, it, it, I think it depends, and it goes back to how specific or how clear is the guidance in the state otherwise, right? Um, if the guidance in the state doesn't have MPU, but it does say it's, it's where the service is delivered, or something like that, right? Well, that becomes very simple if it's a one-to-one -one transaction, but what does it mean to deliver when I've got 20 different licenses under one sale, right? I would say that within that, that framework, it doesn't specifically say, here's how you do multiple points of use, but I would just, yeah, I would advise them constitutionally, if you've only got 5% in that state, we're not giving them 100, right? Um, and, and I've seen that with stand audit on multiple occasions. 
Um, so we're kind of um, nearing our end here. I'm going to release the uh, second poll, which everybody already saw. <laughs> um, Have you performed a multi-state review of the taxability of digital goods or services for your company or clients? Um, I know a lot of people out here may not need to perform reviews. Um, you know, they're like, I don't deal with stuff like this. Um, just say no then, um, if, you're, if you're worried about CP. <laughs> um, one other place, um, Rose reached out and said, is there a place where we can find recent cases related to characterization of sales? Sam and I actually are in the process of taking this presentation and we're going to make it kind of a blog post that does highlight a number of these things. So as soon as we have that, if you're interested in the end survey, we'll ask if you're interested in follow-up materials and things like that. Um, we'll just, we'll just shoot it over to you. Um, I think we have gotten max participation. So, okay. And I will share the results. See that. So most people have never performed a review. Um, but 21%, good job, recently relied, 17% need updating, um, and then another 25% have worked with clients together. So that's about the breakdown I'm expecting. And frankly, we've got a pretty um, hardworking crew here because often we come across people who have, have uh, never produced one or not relying on one, um, and they can often run into trouble. Um, you're gonna receive a Nexus questionnaire someday. So compliance insights. Um, Okay, so we've just gone, we've, we've gone through your business. We've said, yes, we think that this is a taxable service. Um, and we've said, yes, we think it's a portion to the state. What next, <laughs> right? Um, that's really the matrix that we were referencing in that poll question is how do you handle going from filing in one state to filing in a bunch of states? How, from a documentation standpoint, do you reduce exposure or um, avoid exposure altogether? Um, and how do you make sure that you, you're on solid footing with your customers in either co in collecting and remitting tax from them? So there are a lot of things to really consider as you go through this process. The first is you wanna ide identify your material states, right? Where do we have the most receipts attributable to? Which states do we know are the most aggressive? Um, but then there are other concerns that we, we wanna take into account as well. Yeah, so bundle transactions is something that we've touched on uh, earlier in some of these cases, like the, the first one you have here, the, the Wisconsin case about CLE. I, I don't want to go through that again, but what, what often happens here is you have something that is taxable, so maybe a taxable digital good, but a non-taxable service, and you're trying to figure out what's the true object here. Because the idea behind a bundle transaction is you have two products that are otherwise distinct or identifiable, but they're sold for one bundled or non-itemized price. So then how, what is it? How is it characterized? Is it taxable? Is it not taxable? Um, I think in the interest of time, I want to talk about quickly this Texas private letter ruling. It's 2017, so it's, it's one of the older rulings we have in this presentation. But I think it's really interesting because in that case, you have a CRM, a customer relationship management tool, and advisory services. And the question was, what was that bundled service? Is it taxable like the CRM or is it not taxable like the advisory services? And what Texas ultimately concludes is, even though they're separately stated, because they're not unrelated, we're going to tax the whole thing, which just seems wrong here. And they knew it was unrelated because uh, the, the CRM, the agreements were tied to the sale of the services. They ended at the same point. So in that regard, they thought that they were unrelated. But, but geez, what a tough precedent going forward for a bundled service. Um, yeah, is there anything else you wanna to touch on here, Chris, just since we have two minutes, so I wanna make sure we can say everything we want. Yeah, yeah just keeping, keeping this in mind, understanding the nuance here, it really does emphasize the importance of reviewing how you invoice your clients, what your terms and agreement conditions look like. Um, are there ways that you can sort of protect yourself or isolate things? Often when you see a sale of a digital product or service um, or software for that matter, you have ongoing maintenance service agreements, things like that. How can we separate those two things out? How do we fairly um, attribute cost to one element versus the other? Those are all just important things to look into as you sort of determine whether you are you know, um, doing your best job with compliance. 
Yeah, and, and I think the first step is just really getting to know the business. If you're on the advisory side or if you are the business, taking a look at the terms of agreement, the invoices, the agreement, because you might think it's one thing just based on the way you've always characterized it internally, but maybe the way that you actually describe it on paper is entirely different. And maybe we can characterize it as a non-taxable service instead of a taxable digital good or vice versa. And that was the case in J2 Cloud, right? And here they are telling us that, okay, well, th this is the kind of service we provide and everything like that in court, but all of their marketing, everything else, described them as an e-fax service. And, and the um, appellate board ultimately hung their hat on that. R really quickly, um, sale for resale, or Sam and I talked about this this morning, manufacturing exemptions, things like that. Let's not be myopic and say, okay, fine, it looks like this type of transaction is taxable, uh, it's sourced there, we're done. Um, it could be repackaged by your customer and resold. It could be subject to some other kind of exemption. So these are important things to just keep in mind. And, and finally, if I'm going to emphasize one thing about income tax implications here is we could undertake this matrix, say your services are not taxable anywhere, um, but you still have millions of dollars apportioned to a state. You may have an income tax obligation based on your digital presence in the state, even if we've concluded you're not subject to sales tax on your sales. Um, so th that often is we do this whole project and we say, nope, not taxable, you, you look clear. And then we realize, but wait a second, you, you definitely will have an income tax concern. And for some companies, that's not a big problem, right? It's just how we're splitting up the pie. But particularly if you're a pass-through entity or something like that, the partners or shareholders are taking that hit and they might not like a voluntary disclosure agreement that requires them to pay three, three years of back taxes. So just something to keep in mind as you go through this process. Um, it's a little hard to ask questions in, you know, this format, but we are happy to stay online if anybody else has questions. Um, otherwise, you know, just thanks for attending everybody. Um, and stay safe and healthy out there. Yeah, thanks for tuning in. And as always, feel free to reach out either by email or phone. Uh, we're happy to talk through any of these issues with you.